should deal with problems such as climate change. But not everybody buys into that idea. And buried inside our common future is a very interesting quotation because while they were putting the report together, they went around the world and they actually held hearings and listened to people. Uh, and in Brazil, somebody came forward and said this, which I think is a remarkable piece of analytic prose. You talk very little about life. You talk too much about survival. I can guarantee you he had not read Agamben. Um, but it is important to remember that when the possibilities for life are over, the possibilities for survival start. So life is here being juxtaposed against survival, and I think the speaker is calling attention to the scale at which we understand problems. Life belongs to the individual. Survival is part of an abstract community, dislocated from time and place and put somewhere in circulation as an abstract idea. There are peoples here in Brazil, especially in the Amazon region, who still live. That's an unbelievably poignant statement. And these people that still live don't want to reach down to the level of survival. So sustainable development, as understood by the World Commission, according to this speaker, is a degradation. It's a degradation of life itself by translating life into this concept of survival. And do we then have one world, as was presupposed in a lot of global thinking, including global thinking about the climate? And again, this cartoon, I think, uh, calls attention to the contradictions of that unitary idea about as well as any text that I have ever seen. Um, Yo Amigo, it's called the Yo Amigo cartoon. We need that tree to protect us from the greenhouse effect. So whose is the greenhouse effect? Who is the we? What right has somebody to tell somebody else what to do with their tree? You know, these are all political questions that have not gone away in the world. They're still playing out in very urgent and to some extent disruptive ways. So what about Nehru's vision and how does the world live with respect to energy? And here are some juxtapositions that may cause us to think. So that is a picture of a friend of mine standing with the backdrop of a northern Welsh nuclear power plant behind him. And that is a picture of a hut in a major Indian tourist city, Kajuraho, uh, which probably attracts more tourists than just about any other site outside of Delhi and Agra. And just on the outskirts, across from one of the more peripheral temple complexes, there was this hut. The little disks that you see sticking up are still the kind of fuel that many people in India use. They're cow dung patties that are being dried there on the roof. So these are not different historical periods. It's the same world, just in different places. And what are we talking about when we're talking about sustainability? Which world are we actually thinking about? So, of course, many people are thinking about it, and it's well to remember that knowledge making is happening everywhere, not just in the North or in the West. And I want to put two things side by side. So the Center for Science and Environment is probably the leading environmental organization of national and international stature in India. In 1982, they produced their first environmental report, and it was called the First Citizens Report. And they had a little statement of mission, changes in the environment have a direct impact on the lives of the people, particularly the poor who are dependent on their immediate environment for their basic needs. Uh, so uh, somebody yesterday in one of the sessions uh, flashed up a statement of, I think, Aristotle about democracy being government by the poor because there are many more of them. Uh, in that case, you can take this as a statement about uh, environment as it connects to democracy because at the center of the CSE's citizens' report is the idea that the lives of people 
who are dependent on the environment. That is the reason why we're talking about environment. So you can already, in your own imagination, connect the World Commission's statement about the global Earth, which has, you know, human activity is irrelevant, and it's the soils and the greenery that matter, uh, and contrast it with this kind of a statement, which says, no, we care about the soils and the greenery, but we care about it because it sustains human life in certain ways, and inequality is the center of the analysis there. Whereas in the same year, the World Resources Institute began publishing its global environmental indicators, and they too said what their mission was. WRI's founders saw the need for an institution that would be independent and broadly credible, not as an activist environmental membership organization, so you must conclude that for WRI, CSE would appear as an activist, mission-oriented organization, and that would carry out policy research and analysis in their relationship to population and development goals. So population and development are terms very different from lives of the people. The Brazilian speaker talked about lives. The World Resources Institute talks about population. Uh, and that research and analysis had to be both scientifically sound and politically practical. So politically practical, not politically transformative, not politically just, not politically viable even. Uh, it becomes policy discourse, it's domesticated. Politics becomes a matter of analysis, a matter of reason. So it's interesting to trace the story of the Center for Science and Environment, and one of the things that I find quite, um, uh, well, uh, amusing in a wry way is if you look at their first report, it is very cottage industry-like. You can sort of see the Indian glue with which they put the cover onto the volume. Um, and if you open it up, one of the first editions that I am a proud owner of, the first page is upside down. So the cover was glued on to the book itself by people who weren't paying attention to you know, what the text inside. And this isn't a Canadian book that is half upside down so that you can turn it over and read it in French. I mean, this is, you know, so, uh, so this is, um, or maybe half over and read it in English, depending on which side you take to be the first. Um, in any case, uh, this is a different kind of organization that is uh, carrying out the mission of collecting knowledge. People in STS talk about participatory research and so on as if it's bloodless, but it isn't. I mean, there are real lives, there are real people gluing real covers onto real books, talking to real other people. Data already is a remove from the lives of the people. And I think we need ourselves in our own affective research to regain that connection as we talk about what is at stake. Now, both CSE and WRI, the World Resources Institute, showed that they clearly were aware that knowledge making has a politics because both of them say something about the underlying presuppositions of how they're making knowledge. And I find this quite interesting. 1982, two organizations, opposite sides of the world, both with an ethos, both saying this is what we're striving for when we're making global knowledge. And they are different. So CSE, the Center for Science and Environment, explicitly says its focus is on India. It explicitly says that its report offsets that of the state uh, with well, the state's knowledge. It explicitly says that they will receive and take no outside grants in order to produce their research, but rely on voluntary organizations. And they don't say evidence, they say testimony. And that word has quite interesting resonance, which we can talk about later if you want. And they say that there are values animating our work, and the values are self-reliance, lack of hierarchy, and non-sexist knowledge production. The World Resources Institute also, in its preliminary introductory observation, says what it is doing, and it says its focus is on the world. It says that it is agenda setting for international action. It says that it got a $15 million foundation grant. 
It says that it's relying on expert analysts. It says that it's conducting assessment. And it says it has values, integrity, innovation, urgency, independence, and respect. Uh, so, you know, back to co-production. We are talking about global imaginaries. We're talking about how we redesign the world. We're talking about sustainability, a term that's taken over, that architects are using as a mantra in order to figure out how to conduct space and so on. But we're talking about a world that is multiply different, different in ethos, different in approaches to knowledge making, different in self-understandings. And on top of that, we're laying, we're overlaying a vocabulary. And I think that it's up to STS to begin to unpack those things and figure out where we come in. So the second case, which I will do at less length, is about biotechnology, because many people know this already. But nevertheless, it's worth recalling a little bit about how the design sensibility of biotechnology grows up differently in different places and meets up with certain kinds of resistance as it goes traveling around the world. So you can think of biotechnology as a precursor to today's infatuation with geoengineering in some circles. Indeed, I think biotechnology as applied to agriculture is a form of geoengineering, potentially, depending on the scale at which you carry it out. And therefore, I think it's perfectly appropriate to use the language of experiment in trying to carry out an analysis of biotechnology. So with experiments, of course, we all have Thomas Kuhn's terminology in our heads, normal experiments. They're a part of our cultural repertoire. What are normal experiments? Well, we know that normal experiments happen within particular conceptual constraints that Kuhn called paradigms. And the questions, the methods, the interpretive rules, they all come out of those paradigms. Uh, we also know from other work in STS that experiments are contained and constrained in various ways. So the laboratory, which is such a popular subject of study in STS, is one of these enclosed domains. And we also know through other work in STS that experiments have ethical constraints on them, such as the provision that um, research ought not to be against public order in some sense and other ethical constraints on research. So all of this is part of our packaging today of what a normal experiment ought to look like. Now look at experiments without borders. And experiments without borders, I think, are not that for everything. They're conceptually non-paradigmatic. They're physically beyond containment. They are temporally not limited to one time or one space. And they cross ontological boundaries. That is, they create and produce things that we do not know how to classify from the beginning. They produce political crossovers as well between scales, between um, cultural uh, substrates and settings. And of course, STS an analysis is very good at taking apart those translations, but not necessarily the full cross-cultural implications of the translations. And the experiments without borders take us into territories that have no moral mapping around them. So into that territory of experiments without borders comes biotechnology and it decides, uh, well, people, proponents of biotechnology decide that they are going to uh, unleash, in effect, an experiment upon the world. But they have to make it look like a normal scientific experiment. And the site at which this happens, where an experiment without borders becomes tamed into an experiment that looks normal, was a Asilomar in the United States. And the Asilomar moment was very interesting because it set the parameters for the American imagination of biotechnology as a policy matter and also as a scientific and technological matter. So we can talk about the Asilomar settlement. Usually that term is used in politics. Settlements are thought of as political settlements. But we can equally use it in STS to talk about the Asilomar settlement. The settlement said that scientists could go forward and do biotechnology, but under certain constraints that would produce an environment of containment, physical, biological, to some degree intergenerational. And they 
stipulated what those constraints and conditions should be. So physically, the labs should be geared to the risk levels and going from P1 to P4. The biological entities should likewise be weakened. And they said that things that do not meet these strictures are impermissible. So at a cinemar, a fact that we tend not to remember nowadays, they said that field releases are just too uncertain and they ought not to happen. So they belong to a prohibited class of experiment. Well, within a couple of years, the scientific community had decided that actually field releases pose no risks. And therefore, with very little legal debate, the field releases began. And then it was necessary in some way to take environmental assessment and put it on as a retrofitting to the idea of field releases. It was not there from the start. And this sort of diagram was frequently used in the early years of genetic engineering. And the thing I would call your attention to is the little scissors, which you may not be able to see, just under where it says DNA. I mean, so on the top left, it says extracting the gene of interest. And then it's like a person of interest. And then little scissors showing the snipping. So that scissors snipping analogy fed into the metaphor of containment because it's so precise, you know exactly what you're doing. The thing of interest can be identified exactly, you know what its characteristics are, therefore there's no danger, therefore things are contained. Well, so we in America learned to think of these as contained, but not everybody bought in, including some people within America itself. So this is a little bit of a David and Goliath story because Ben and Jerry's at that time was still a smallish ice cream company based in Vermont. And they had a big fight with the federal government about the labeling of their ice cream. To this day, labeling of genetically modified ingredients and genetically modified foods remains a topic of contestation in America. Just two years ago, California had a referendum to label GM ingredients in food, and it lost because of a huge last-minute lobbying effort by the biotech foods industry. Uh, so Ben and Jerry's had to find a compromise uh, and so they had to say not that their ice creams are free from, re from recombinant bovine growth hormone, but that they try to source their milk from cows that are not treated. So they have to go through these loops. And so the resistance in America has itself been disciplined along certain um, legal and policy um, um, preconditions. But the dissent in other countries took different forms. And famously in Britain, uh, Prince Charles spearheaded the dissent to some extent. Uh, this was one of Prince Charles's moments of glory. He, was, uh, he won almost uh, universal praise from the British press for having, not from the science community, but for having stood up to science. And he asked 10 questions. One of them was, why are the rules for approving GM foods so much less stringent than those for new medicines produced using the same technology? Uh, and a self-appointed uh, spokesperson for biotech spoke up against him. And this was his answer. Drugs are tested on animals at hundreds of times their clinical doses. That is not possible with food, so different ways have been devised. But if you really want to start trials in humans, 300 million Americans have been eating GM soya for several years now without any ill effects. So listen to what the scientific discourse here is doing. On the one hand, it is providing reassurance. On the other hand, it's taking me and close to 300 million of my country people and saying that we have been unwitting subjects of one of these experiments without borders, and I can again assure you that my informed consent was not sought when I was enrolled as an experimental subject into this particular experiment. Uh, so no, no wonder then that the particular forms of containment and the particular imaginations of what is a responsible experiment that we came up with in the American context 
have not been widely shared around the rest of the world that has other ways of doing business with these particular things. So food is not an experiment and genetic engineering. I mean, these sorts of things are cropping up all over the place. Um, in Britain, um, where you have peers of the realm willing to go to jail at least for a few hours on these uh, kinds of um, causes, um, experiment, experimental fields were uprooted. But the interesting thing is that these forms of resistance are still going on. So most recently in the Philippines, there was an episode of fields being uprooted. Um, I talked about imaginaries being performed, and one has to turn to Britain with its great grand the theatrical traditions for performances that are somewhat unlike those that you would find in the US. Uh, there are demonstrations outside the White House, but Tony Don't Swallow Bill's Seed is only possible in the British context with its love of puns and its love of wordplay. And I think Downing Street has a different performative uh, spatial quality to it. Again, these are matters for STS analysis. I mean, what is the space outside of our major centers of government? That is a kind of analysis that I would like to see more of, because here you see yet another ruling space with a different kind of resistance being mounted on the same subject. So I don't have time to go into these kinds of things in huge detail, but one can get at these things analytically by doing comparative work, by doing historical work, by doing serious interpretive work on discourses and on performances and on policy documents and so on and so forth. There's a whole methodology, and as I say, we have these tools already. So you can compare, for instance, the German imaginary as it re relates to nuclear power and trace out some similarities and some differences with respect to biotechnology. But in both cases, what looms largest in the German imaginary is the possibility of an irresponsible state making kinds of policies that are not containable through democratic process. So where America worries about containment as a physical technological matter that can be contained by scientific and technical safeguards, whether it's nuclear, whether it's biotech, the worry in Germany is at least as much about whether there's political accountability should something go wrong and should there be a catastrophic outcome. Our answer to the nuclear catastrophe, what would America do in the case of a nuclear catastrophe, was the Price-Anderson Act, an insurance scheme which said that the American government would step in and pay the costs. So in some sense, we have opted for marketized solutions to even catastrophe, whereas I think on the whole, the German orientation has been to demand a politics that goes along with the insurance. And by the way, just a quick footnote that all of the sort of reductionist attempts to explain everything in German politics as, oh, this is the Holocaust, it ignores history. And it ignores the fact that the German state and its methods of operation already had certain kinds of different ideas about public accountability. One can go back to Kantian and Weberian texts about the relationship between public morality and private morality, and one would find different philosophical playings out of what publicness and privateness imply in relation to one another uh, throughout the course of uh, that nation's history and any nation's history. So I think we need to do that kind of work as well. So coming back to STS, of course Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shove was entirely right yesterday to call attention to the extreme narrowness, the inadequacy of looking at single objects. It may be fun for us to do. I'm not saying we shouldn't do them. Uh, you know, when is a something not a something is a sort of interesting question. When is a cigar not a cigar? I mean, you know, it's interesting to ask those questions, and we may want to keep doing that. But at the same time, it's well to remember that ontologies carry politics. And if we want to be co-productionists, there are other questions that we also need to put on the table. These are questions about the kinds of entities that we want, especially in a world of experimentation, where experiments 
are without borders in the ways that I've suggested. We need to ask who makes the decisions about what kinds of entities we want in the world and to what degree publics are involved in what ways. And we also need to ask what happens in cases of dissent, because at the moment our institutional resources for dealing with dissent are extremely inadequate. So we think we've developed global governance. It's certainly a term that people teach at the Kennedy School. But global governance without any institutions of representation that operate on a global scale, I mean, it is to some degree a contradiction in terms. So to finish up, I think that beside the very notable advances that have been made through the sociological turn in STS, we need an equally active, equally sensitized, and perhaps more energetic political turn, and that is what I'm calling wide-angle STS. For that purpose, I think we need to turn constructivism around, in a sense, so not the constructivism of taking things apart and showing the hybridity. To some extent, that reminds me of all the famous physicists of the early 20th century. Every single one of those boys took a radio apart at some point in his history and then put it back together again. And, you know, okay, putting it back together again is something I'm asking for as well. But maybe in a more gender equal field of development of STS, we need to take apart things other than radios and also look at other sorts of social constructs that are inordinately important to our ways of understanding the world. So what is taken for grantedness? How does normalization happen in any sphere? What is naturalization? What is the long durée? Why do things last? We also need to be vigilant in accounting for belief and consciousness and identity and subjectivity and imagination. To some degree, STS scholars are extremely good at doing this, but inside of particular cases. So subjectivity tends to be treated very much in the context of biomedicine and in doctor-patient relationships, but not so much in the context of sustainability. But my Brazilian speaker speaking back to the World Commission is illustrating a subjectivity, which I think is important for us to take into account. We also need to think about silences, and again, some in the STS community are doing this, but I think we need to do it in a more systematic way and not as an appendix to knowledge formation. So the work that says, okay, we generated the knowledge about, um, well, we failed to generate the knowledge about occupational disease. I think that is important, but I think that the problem of silencing, the problem of what we ignore, the problem of discourses that are missing, uh, is a far more widespread problem, and I think we need to take account of that. And all of this can be summed up in what I think is the overall message of what I'm saying, which is that we, as STS scholars, as design scholars, need to be constantly aware in our activities, whether these are analytic, academic, practitioner-oriented, whether they're building things or writing books or teaching people. We need to be aware of the normativity that I think is always already present in any of our constructions of reality. So let me stop there. Thank you.